Its 21 members account for 55 percent of global GDP, uh, 45 percent of global trade, uh, 40 percent of the world's population, uh, and particularly for the United States, 60 percent of U.S. goods go to APEC countries, uh, and five of America's top seven trading partners are APEC nations. So uh, for uh, the United States, in a, in a period of economic retrenchment and economic uh, re rebuilding, uh, as well as globally, the fact that this uh, multinational, multi-year effort continues is one that I think uh, has drawn the attention of people both inside and outside the administration, of course, uh, as a way to try to figure out whether these types of institutions are sustainable and actually make a significant difference in building architectures of trade uh, and regionalism, or whether uh, APEC, as some have claimed, has lost its steam and plays an increasingly uh, insignificant role in the wake of bilateral and other multilateral agreements. I want to stress the alignment of views among the United States, Singapore, and Japan in particular. Including Singapore later this week, we are, we are the next three hosts of APEC, with Japan taking the baton next year and the United States in 2011, as Misha indicated. This trajectory presents a unique opportunity to advance a positive agenda in APEC and potentially to take the forum to a new level. It will enable us to promote U.S. business and investment opportunities for the benefit of American workers and businesses of all sizes. It will also be an opportunity for the United States to define a new 21st century economic policy agenda for the Asia-Pacific region. We have blundered at times in the past, and I would take the 1997 push for the early uh, sectoral, agree uh, sectoral uh, reciprocity voluntary. agreement, voluntary sectoral ag agreements, voluntary at the beginning, reciprocity at the end, uh, as, as an example of that. And I think it, it is to our interest in whatever, however we go forward, is to have allies out in East Asia really take the lead. And it would be in our interest for Japan and Singapore. And Singapore, by the way, has been trying to do this. Singapore, some of you may know the details better than I, but Singapore has since, the elect since January, I think, sent three delegations, in including last week, as you mentioned, Lee Kuan Yew, to sort of warn the United States it's time to get forward. We'd like to, can we do some planning about APEC? Uh, they knew from the beginning that you had this opportunity that Jeff referred to of they were chairing it this, this year, Japan, the next year in the United States. Those could have been really key meetings that you, you had some sort of progressive planning. You can still do that with Japan, I think, in the United States. Uh, and it should be attracted, by the way, just as a footnote, the U.S. The US uh, meeting and the, whoever chairs the uh, session is, is, that's quite important for that nation, comes at the, in November of 1911, just before Mr. Obama goes into a presidential campaign. I would think that the, the people in the White House, whether it was the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the pillow guys who don't know any economics, and they look at this just as, oh, well, what do we, how's the president going to be pos positioned? This would be a great way to posi position President Obama for the, elect, for the election coming up. If there was some sort of major advance that could come out of the meeting that we chaired uh, in two years. But I don't think there's been any thinking about that. But to go back to my point, I think it is, it is to, to finish here, I think it is important, uh, if, if possible, for the United States actually to quietly confer with its, with its key, key allies, as I say, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and have them take the lead. Competitive liberalization is alive and well and living in East Asia. Uh, and that will continue to be the case whether the U.S. remains uh, uh, engaged and continues to pursue agreements, uh, whether, it can, whether it implements its existing agreements or, or not. Uh, so the question will be, will the United States engage or sit on the sideline? We already see the cost of inaction. Uh, already evident in uh, the initialing a few weeks ago of a free trade agreement between the European Union and Korea. Uh, which will lead to some trade diversion uh, of U.S. exports from the European and Korean markets, and which can easily be remedied. All we have to do is implement the Chorus FTA. Now, what happens uh, this week and going forward? I think that all the indications that we see is that the United States will re-engage in Asia for the reasons that have been pointed out by the previous two speakers. I mean, Asia is the the, the growth pole of the world economy right now. It is of strategic uh, interest to the United States. 
and uh, and so uh, we will see a number of of, of of indications or signals of this reengagement. Uh, first, perhaps uh, the U.S. ASEAN summit, which is a break from the past, where the president will meet with all the leaders of the ASEAN, uh, and will probably invite uh, the, those leaders to come back to the United States for another summit next year. Uh, next, we will probably see some progress in the bilateral uh, uh, discussions between the United States and Korea, moving forward uh, on uh, uh, towards implementing the Chorus FDA uh, uh, by uh, developing uh, or, or, or pursuing work on initiatives somewhat comparable to the supplemental agreements that President Clinton pursued to get NAFTA through the Congress in 1993. This one will be more sectorally focused, I believe, on, on, on autos and a few other, other uh, uh, sectors. And uh, uh, probably some new APEC initiatives. Uh, and what is really needed is a new policy in APEC, not concerted unilateralism, but rather concerted bilateralism, taking all the bilateral issues, uh, initiatives that have, have been pursued and melding them together into a common regional infrastructure. The conventional wisdom is, and the Obama administration has pushed this, Matt can react to it as he wishes, that uh, certainly since June, we had a lot of, in the spring, we had a lot of optimistic statements coming out of the administration about moving forward with the existing FTAs, about getting more on the table, the Doha, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly in June, that stopped. And I don't know anything about the internal details, but I gather that there was some meeting in the White House or somewhere that said, look, we can't do this until we get the domestic agenda uh, in order. And we've got a tough slog to go through that. So basically what the administration was saying, or the spokesman was saying, is that we can't really go forward, if anything, on the trade front until the health uh, and then there was the climate change the health uh, legislation is through and then the climate change and we get out of the of the, the recession that this kind of open end is where you end it so that a lot of talk about the president make, making a major trade speech went by the board you still had leaks or you had people talking to administration officials kirk got out of hand a couple of times and seemed to support the tpp and he was pulled back immediately by the white house so you've had a kind of um, push forward, but not really anything that the White House it itself has endorsed. The Obama administration should not stay aloof from the East Asian community building process. The cost of ignoring the EAS or the ESC are too high. As Jeff Bader, Director of Asian Affairs at the U.S. National Security Council put it in the recent speech at Brookings, the U.S. is without question an Asia-Pacific nation, but it will remain an Asia-Pacific mm. power not by loud assertions that it is so, but by demonstrating it through conduct and presence. So in many ways, the East Asia, uh, United States is also an East Asian nation, uh, by at least its presence, by, by history, if not by culture necessarily. The East Asian summit and the East Asian community idea is not going to fade away as skeptics of Mahathir's 1990 proposal for an East Asian economic grouping found out. In the long term, in my view, East Asia could prove to be a better bet for the U.S. Uh, whether to maintain its current position as the dominant player in the region or, as is more likely, to manage its relative decline uh, in the best possible way.